the following is a segment from the Carl King Podcast. If you enjoy this show, be sure to like, subscribe, and send us burritos. This week's listener question of the week comes from Professor Emma Afterthought. That's a cool name. She asks, Could you talk about what it was like making your first documentary, Morgan Ogren's Conundrum? Any advice for someone who wants to make a documentary? Okay, well, let me take you back in time and tell you how and why this documentary really happened. And to do that, I need to explain why I was motivated to even make a documentary. And the answer might be unexpected. Back in May 2011, the band Dream Theater put out this sort of YouTube documentary series where they were auditioning drummers. And boy, did that make me angry. I felt like those guys were taking advantage of my favorite drummers. Because I knew some of those guys like Virgil Donati and Marco Miniman. They had played on my records. And their own music is, from a technical standpoint, so far beyond the music of Dream Theater. Like, do you seriously think Virgil Donati or Marco Miniman would struggle with that music or even have to audition? Because I felt like it should have been the other way around. And I can't speak for them, but I felt insulted on their behalf. I didn't like the cheesy reality show aspect of it and how their tiny mistakes in rehearsal were hyped up for the publicity. Well, I figured, well, I'll show them. I would make a drummer documentary. Or maybe even a series of drummer documentaries. Why not? I would avenge those darn Dream Theater videos. So in March the next year, I decided, for the first one, I'm going to focus on three drummers. Virgil Donati, Marco Miniman, and one of my favorites, Morgan Ogren. And Morgan would be coming to the U.S. in May, just two months later, so the timing was perfect. But there was a small problem. I had never made a documentary before. I had done a lot of sort of low-budget video work, but it was mostly in-studio corporate stuff. Very stiff, very dry. I honestly don't even think I had a very good camera that could shoot in high-quality 1080p at the time. My friend Zeke had shot several documentaries on the Sony EX-1 and EX-3, So I rented one of them just three days before Morgan arrived in the U.S. And I had to learn fast. At that point, I don't think I even really understood the exposure triangle. And I filmed the whole thing in 30 frames per second, which I now regret. So I put together a little crew, me, Zeke Pystrup, and Mark Thornton, and filmed Morgan at Drum Channel, Musicians Institute in Hollywood, and what was called Los Angeles Music Academy in Pasadena. And I leaned heavily on Zeke, as he had so much experience physically shooting documentaries and running around with a heavy camera like that. And after the first day of filming Morgan, I decided I would make the documentary only about him, because I was feeling really good about what we were making together. So after Morgan flew back to Sweden, I drove around interviewing as many musician people as I could like Dweezil Zappa and Brendan Small and Dave Elich. And the next month, I launched a Kickstarter. And we raised $17,000. In the end, that was barely enough to cover all the total expenses and the Kickstarter rewards. And by the way, if you're wondering, none of that budget was used to pay me. I made $0 up front. Anyway, we bought Morgan a plane ticket to come back a few months later in September. And he brought a gig pig, which is a bizarre Swedish all-in-one drum kind of contraption. We crammed everything into my little car, and I drove Morgan around Los Angeles, and he played that thing in unusual places, like on top of a mountain. And we rented out Bell Sound in Hollywood for a couple days, and invited Tosin Abasi of Animals as Leaders and some others to come and jam with him and record the whole thing. And I even took Morgan out to Marco Miniman's house, where they did some impromptu jams that can be seen in the film. It took a year of editing, and the film was released October 1st, 2013. And the DVDs were released a couple of months later on December 12th, 2013. 
And later, I put out three more hours of scenes called Conundrum Undone, with extended full-length interviews and extra scenes that couldn't fit on the DVD. And here's something that people might not realize. I split the profits of the film with Morgan 50-50. Now, I don't know how many documentaries do that, but I'm guessing it's not many. I think a lot of documentary filmmakers probably keep the profits to themselves and figure the subject of the documentary should just be happy to be on camera and get the exposure. And I didn't want to do that because I didn't think it was fair. And this documentary is one of the few creative projects I've made that continues to generate some monthly income. And believe me, it's not a lot because Morgan and I have each earned about $2,500 total in the 10 years since it's been released. I think if you do the math, that comes out to about $250 a year or $20 a month. And the majority of that income came from Vimeo rentals and sales because it's the only place it's available and that has worked out well. Here's a funny thing. In the DVD liner notes, Morgan sent me a huge thank you list. And in contrast, I simply thanked my wife, my animal friends, my crew, and Dream Theater. Now for the record, I am no longer angry at Dream Theater. I've learned to accept that people will make and enjoy whatever music they want, and there's no point in focusing on things I don't personally like. If you want to hear more about that topic, I have a feature segment called How I Conquered My Anger in episode 23 of this podcast. Because you know what? In the end, Dream Theater probably exposed more people to my drummer friends with those millions of YouTube views and it motivated me to make a documentary about Morgan. So it's kind of a win-win. And also, a lot of musician people enjoyed it. And it did directly help Morgan increase his visibility and grow his career. Devin Townsend attributed his interest in Morgan partially to this documentary being made. So I would say, mission accomplished. Now, let me share some bits of trivia about the film. Number one, the opening scene... That was filmed by one of Morgan's friends in Sweden. So the movie starts and ends there in Morgan's backyard, you know, being happy with his wife and his musical soulmate, Mats Oberg. And I thought that was a nice touch, something I was not able to capture here in L.A. Number two, back then I did not know much about color correction. So I overexposed and oversaturated everything in post because I did what seemed to look good to me on my Apple monitor. But there are industry standards for a reason. Watching it at home, I had no idea why everything looked totally bleached out. I figured it was probably just my crappy TV. Oops. So, that was an important learning experience. At least one mistake I'll never make again. Number three, my favorite scene is Morgan and Marco Miniman playing tennis because that was the only scene where I felt that Morgan opened up psychologically and talked a bit about his OCD tendencies. And I wish the film could have focused way more on that. But here's the thing. When Morgan isn't drumming, he's this gentle, quiet, and calm person. If you've ever seen him play, he really lets loose and expresses himself through music, but he didn't have a whole lot to say. Part of that could be that English isn't his native language, but during interviews, he would mostly return to the point that he simply loves music. I couldn't get a lot more out of him, and I think that shows where his heart is. My second favorite scene is the one where we visit Simon Phillips. And it was hilarious to me that Simon was as picky and technical and specific about coffee beans as he was about the fancy potentiometers in his mixing board. That cutting back and forth between him preparing coffee and mixing music is movie magic, in my opinion. But you know what? I laugh every time I watch that non-sequitur scene with Mike Stone doing water tests at the pool store and his parrot falling asleep. So that is probably my favorite scene of all. Number four, there are a few fake characters in the film, and one of them was named Mildrick's Pulchers, which I think is a nod at the name Millard Mulch. Mildrick's Pulchers, Millard Mulch. 
And he was played by John Schnepp. John would wear a blonde wig when we went to parties. So I bought him a Zildjian hat and some drumsticks and a practice pad. And I just told him to play the part of a jealous rival drummer. Kind of a nobody. And I fed him content and references. And he just improved all around it. And we shot that interview at Titmouse, the animation studio where they made Metalocalypse. That little studio room was their actual VO studio where all of those characters' voices are recorded. Over the years, so many people hated Mildrick's Pulchers and didn't realize he was fake. And John and I both thought that was hilarious. And there is one other fake character which no one has ever said anything about. And that really surprised me. Okay, so now to answer your questions, Professor Emma Afterthought. Thanks for sticking with me. Here's what I strongly recommend to anyone who wants to make a documentary. Four things. Number one, try to time your documenting on an important event so that your subject or your main character has a goal. Now, try to find or set up danger or risk of some sort so that you can film the lead up, the actual event, and the aftermath, because it builds suspense and forward motion. You know, for example, the subject is going to try to blank. Will they succeed? Or this is the first time this has been attempted. Otherwise, you're just rolling the camera and hoping something happens that makes it all worth it. For example, some kind of monster that film about Metallica. That was actually a fantastic documentary despite how silly it made them all look at the time. It was a critical time in their career because Metallica were going to get back together to record a new album in the midst of James Hetfield's battle with alcoholism. So you got to see all of that unpredictable behavior. It's a story about recovery and a band trying to reinvent themselves, discovering how to make music again. And the results were super entertaining. In contrast, what I ended up with for this Morgan movie was a pretty casual series of events with no stakes. There's no narrative flow and there's no story to it. It was more of an artist biography with commentary, kind of like a home movie of a family vacation. You know, we went here, then we went there. It's Morgan coming to the U.S. and doing some great drumming and famous musician people talking about him, which is fine, but it's not too compelling as a human story. Still, I do believe it's a warm and at times pretty funny tribute to one of my favorite creative musicians. And two, if I were to make another documentary, which I probably will someday, I would cut down on all the talking heads and celebrity interviews and simply add a narrator where needed. I would focus on interviewing only the people who were central to the narrative and events. My production model for this movie was Behind the music, music specials on VH1 in the 90s, which is not the ideal template, but that's all I knew how to do at the time, and I did my best with it. Number three, ask yourself why you want to make a documentary. Is it to get revenge on Dream Theater? Is it because you're simply passionate about a subject? Or is it because you want to make $250 a year? Being clear about the purpose is going to help you focus on what's important because it's an incredible amount of work with a great deal of creative risk. You can't entirely control the contents of a documentary unless it's fake and scripted out, but then it would be a mockumentary. So if you want guaranteed results, maybe make one of those instead. Number four, I think the best way to learn to make documentaries is just to make one. Just decide you're going to do it and work backwards from there, because that's exactly what I did. To wrap this up, the 10-year anniversary of Morgan Ogren's conundrum is coming up next year. So I'd like to do a 10-year anniversary re-release in 4K. I want to go back and fix the coloring and the exposure and properly convert it to 24 frames per second. I'd like to give it updated cover art because Morgan was never really happy with that photo of him. And I insisted on it because it was really funny to me at the time, and I thought it would be attention grabbing. But I plan to have Lance do a new concept that would better represent Morgan's personality. And I also want to get it on more streaming platforms like Amazon and Apple. So, Morgan Ogren fans, hang in there for that. 
And to watch the film, go to morganogrenmovie.com. If you enjoyed this segment from the Carl King Podcast, remember, you can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or through an old rubber hose.